I said last week that I wouldn't do this too often, but I have to refer to our, our Scotland trip again, so fresh on my mind. We were in Edinburgh, which is the capital of Scotland, and we were able to see the new Parliament building, which is as ugly a building as you would ever want to see. It just doesn't fit with the beautiful old structures there. But uh, on, on the Parliament building were plaques, scripture sayings, and other sayings. And there's one that uh, I really loved, and it's going to become mine. And here's how it goes. This doesn't have to do with the sermon, but it has to do with my preaching in general. And that saying was, say but little and say it well. I really like that. Say but little. You may think that preaching a short sermon is easy. It's not. It's hard to prepare just 15 or 20 minutes when you could go for 45 minutes or longer. But I really want that to be my motto. I'll say little, but I want to say it well. Now, in our study of the Gospel of Mark, which we started three weeks ago, last week we talked about the beginning of Jesus' public ministry and how after his baptism and after his temptation in the wilderness, uh, he returned to Galilee and he began preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand and that people should repent and believe the good news. Now Mark is going to tell us about some of the specific things that happened during the early days of his ministry. Last week, my text was two verses long. It's much longer this week. It's going to be Mark chapter 1. I'm going to have it up here, David, on the, on the screen, I think. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 45. Before I read that, though, I want you to hear this scripture that Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, until I get there, Timothy, where you are in Ephesus, focus on reading the scripture to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. And I believe the most important thing I do in my preaching is reading the scripture. And that's what I want to do. So you'll have a, a lengthy reading today with a few comments about it. But we should be so blessed by the hearing of the word of God. But here it is. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who has authority and not as teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. And news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you. And Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. So they traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, driving out demons. 
A man with leprosy came to him and and begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places, and yet the people came to him from everywhere. There are five scenes in this passage, and I'm not going to talk at length except about one of them. But all of the, all of the scenes, this whole passage has to do with his identity, and with his authority. And I'm so glad we sang that song, Dave, about the authority of Christ. It's all about who he is and his authority. And I think there are some good contemporary lessons we can learn from this. Now, the initial scene, and the one that I'm going to spend time on, is Jesus calling his first disciples in verses 16 through 20. At the Sea of Galilee, he encounters four fishermen, Simon, we know him as Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John. And he calls them to follow him. Now, this is the passage that contains that famous little saying, I will make you fishers of men. And you know, we, we've turned that into a nice little children's story, and we even have a little song about it. I'll make you fishers of men. If, and, and that's good. That's good. Have you ever thought about what this really means? When a fisherman hooks a fish, it has fatal consequences for the fish. Is that not right? Life doesn't go on as before. This image, I will make you fishers of men, tells us about the transforming power of God's rule. God's rule that brings judgment and it brings death to the old, but it promises a new creation. When Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men, he's calling his disciples to become agents of a message that is going to totally transform people's lives. It isn't just this nice little message about how God loves us, and he does. I know all of that. But this is a message that is going to, it's going to kill people. It's going to kill the old man, and it's going to bring new life. But it's a life-changing message that he is charging them with. Well, what's really surprising to me is that Jesus says, follow me, and they follow. Mark gives no indication that they've ever seen Jesus before. I know. Luke and John kind of give the hint that there was an earlier encounter, but we're not in Luke, and we're not in John. I want us to see what Mark is trying to convey, and I think what he's saying is, He's trying to tell us about the force or the authority of Jesus' call. See, this is about who Christ is. He commands as God commands. Do you remember this statement in Psalm 39, verse 9? For he, speaking about God, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. That's what Jesus does. Like God, when he speaks, it happens. Jesus speaks, come follow me, and men are compelled to drop what they're doing and follow him. Jesus speaks, come out of him, and unclean spirits are routed. Jesus speaks, quiet, be still, and the wind stops and the sea is calm. Jesus speaks, little girl, I say to you, get up, and the dead are raised. Jesus speaks, be opened, and the deaf can hear. Jesus speaks, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, and a fig tree withers to the roots. And he speaks from the cross, he cries out from the cross, and the veil in the temple is ripped apart. He is like God. When he speaks, it happens. And I think Mark is underscoring the idea that that Jesus has this unique power as the Son of God, to call people and to transform their lives when he calls them. According to Mark, these four men simply obey. There's nothing else. They simply obey. They walk away from their livelihood. They walk away from whatever security they had, whatever comfort they had in their lives. They just walk away and they follow Jesus. 
They didn't say, well, let me sleep on that tonight, and I'll give you an answer tomorrow. They didn't ask for more time. They didn't say, I need to kind of get my financial affairs in order, and then maybe I'll follow you. They didn't say, wait till my children grow up. None of that. They immediately left everything, and they followed him. And that's the point that Mark is trying to make. And this tells us so much about discipleship. Disciples aren't simply people who fill the pews at worship time. They're not just people who sign pledge cards or attend an occasional Bible study or offer to help out around the church building now and then. They're not merely eavesdroppers and onlookers. Disciples are those who hear Jesus' call to follow and they unconditionally accept his terms of obedience and sacrifice. Disciples are those who are prepared to leave everything behind to follow Christ. Along those lines, I want to tell you a wonderful story that I read this week. It's not maybe real exciting, but it really touched my heart. And there are many, many stories throughout history that are going on right now that that are just like this. But in his commentary on the Gospel of Mark, David E. Garland, and I'm using that commentary and some others, but it's really been helpful. But he tells the story about his maternal grandparents who felt Jesus calling them to go to India in the early 1900s. His grandfather did not qualify for support from the denomination's missionary society, so they decided they would just go as independent faith missionaries. And they were recruited by a man who claimed that if they they collected enough money, they could run this wonderful boarding school while they were learning the language. And so they gathered money from friends and family, enough money to pay their passage to India and support them for a whole year. When they arrived, they found that there was no boarding school and the man had absconded with all of the money. They were stuck in India. No money, no place to live, no work. They begged a ride on a train to Calcutta where some other missionaries took them in. But for some reason, they didn't despair. They didn't give up. They didn't go home. In fact, they started an independent work in the city of BR and became so successful that the mission, the Methodist Mission Board requested that they go to work under their auspices, which they did for the next 36 years. They made enormous sacrifices. Three of their six children died of disease in India. But they also reaped huge spiritual rewards. You might say, well, why'd they stay there? And we could come up with all kinds of reasons. But what they said was the power of the call. The power of the call was so great that it enabled them to make the sacrifices, to do what had to be done. Now, I'm not suggesting we all need to go off to India or some other far off place. But do we have that attitude that when Jesus calls us to discipleship, that we are willing to do whatever he asks? I don't, I don't know what it'll be or what it has been, but do we have that attitude? That's, that's what I think Mark is getting at. Or are we like most other humans who spend their lives consumed with anxiety over earthly and material matters? Does our commitment... To Jesus suffer because we're more committed to preserving our precious standard of life than doing anything else? Now, the stories of healing and deliverance that I read in this text, they indicate that Jesus is able to deliver people. He can deliver from sickness. He can deliver from evil spirits. And I'd like to suggest he can deliver us from the bondage to material concerns just as he can deliver from those other bondages as well. And I think this whole passage should convict us of the truth that our lives should center around God. The authority of his call, the authority of who he is should dispel our hesitancy and awaken our confidence in him. I'm a little hesitant to say what I'm going to say now, but I, I, feel, I feel a need to say it. I, I'm not a prophet. I've heard some prophets recently, I believe, real prophetic voices, but I'm not a prophet. But there's something in my spirit that tells me, as a people, as a nation, 
we are in for some hard times in the future. And I'm thinking financially and economically. I, I think we're really in for some hard times. I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. But what's going to get us through that? And we will go through it. But what's going to get us through it is not confidence in the government, not confidence in the U.S. dollar, not confidence in our investments, not confidence in our meager attempts for some kind of preparedness. It's going to be our commitment to and our confidence in Jesus. And that's going to get us through it. If our trust is anywhere else, we're going to get caught up in the chaos, the hysteria, the panic, the hoarding, and the fear that's going to envelop those who do not know the Lord. But if we have the heart of disciples, a heart that hears and a heart that listens and a heart that obeys, we will know how to respond. We'll know how to respond to people in need. We will be open. We'll be generous. And I believe that the kingdom of God will flourish like never before. And like David Garland's grandparents in India, it, it, it's going to be costly, but it will bring great spiritual rewards. Why put your confidence in Jesus? Well, all the stories in our text tell why. Reveal his authority. He has, he has power over evil spirits, over demons. That's verses 21 through 28, verses 32 and 34, and verse 39. Mentions him three times in this passage. He has power over the fever that was consuming Peter's mother-in-law, verses 29 through 34, has power over leprosy or authority over leprosy, verses 40 through 45, and over disease of every kind when you read verse 34. This portrayal of the authority of Jesus is going to continue all through Mark because that's what he's talking about. Here's who Jesus is. And it will come to its grand conclusion with his resurrection from the dead. Now, I just suppose the question is, will we follow him? Are we following him? I'm not talking about just giving lip service every now and then, but I mean really and truly throwing caution to the wind, committing all that we are and all that we have to him. Are we willing to do that and be his disciples? That's what will get us through whatever lies ahead, good times or bad. That's what will get us through that. And I pray that all of us here will make that kind of commitment. Maybe we've just been hangers-on, pew packers, whatever. But he's calling us to real discipleship, which demands everything that we are and everything that we have. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the power of the call of Jesus. Help us to hear it. Help us to heed and to submit, to be obedient, and to go wherever you want us to go, to do whatever you want us to do. We believe that you have given all authority in heaven and on earth to our Lord Jesus Christ, and we make him Lord of our lives. Help us, Father. Help us in our weaknesses. Help us in those areas where we want to hold back. Help us to live above fear and anxiety and hysteria, panic. Help us to put those things behind us and put our trust totally in him. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.